Amen. Uh, last week, we started home Bible study and uh, of Search for Truth, and we're going to continue it for the next few weeks. Let me run back through some things. The Old Testament, the Old Testament, remember old, three letters, Testament, nine letters, 39 books in the Old Testament. Amen. Old, three letters, Testament, nine letters, three times nine, 27 books in the New Testament. That's a way to always remember that. Remember that there was the books of law, history, poetry, major prophets, minor prophets, 32 writers, 3,600 years, and only one author, and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. So we, we studied last week about the authenticity of the Scriptures, and I do believe that God had a way of delivering to us the Word of God. I believe the Word of God. I listened years ago. I was riding down the road, and I heard a guy on the radio. He said, I believe the Bible so strong, I even believe the concordance. And I even believe the concordance. I believe it so strong. Amen. But uh, tonight, we're going into our second lesson. And uh, the charts are about to go up, and I'm about to begin. And we're going to begin in Genesis chapter 1. And this will be the first chart. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. And God is what I'm about to talk about. The first verse says, in the beginning, God. Just say that with me. In the beginning, God. In other words, God was here when it all started. God is eternal. We'll see that in just a moment. Let me just cover some things, and I'm not going to always look at the chart because I have some notes here, but you can follow along with the things that I say in the chart. Amen. Uh, appropriately, the Bible is called God's Word. It's not my word, it's not an apostle's word, it's not a prophet's word, it's God's word. And, and we tried to establish that last week. So let's talk about what God is, okay? God is, uh, the Bible said, number one, that he is the creator. He's the creator. He created everything that you see. It, it didn't just happen. It didn't just come into being. The very first verse of our Bible said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There was nothing. The Bible, as a matter of fact, verse 2 said, the, the earth was without form and void. There was no form to the earth. It was just a black ball of nothing. But God created the heavens and the earth. So that's where we'll start. And Job, uh, Job said it this way. He stretcheth out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. God just spoke. I want you to understand something today, and I want, I want you to see this in the next few minutes. When we talk about God creating the heavens and the earth, every tree, every river, every bug, every snake, every hippopotamus, every river, every mountain was created by God, and it was created by speaking. God never put his hands on any of that. He created that by speaking the world into existence. And here's what else God is. God is eternal. Everybody say eternal. Eternal means no beginning and no ending. Your finite mind and my finite mind can't even comprehend God in his eternal state because before there was a world, before there was an angel, before there was a man, God was. And guess what? He will be when everything else is gone. He's eternal. God is eternal. He said in Revelations 1 and 8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. He's the eternal God. The Bible said in Psalms 90 and 2, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Another word to describe eternal is infinite, infinite. 
No beginning, no ending, without limitations of time or space. Now, I'm going to get into some stuff when we get into the New Testament and talk to you about why God is eternal, but the Son of God is not eternal. Remember that, and I'll go there in just a few weeks. And then not only is God eternal, but God's alive. How many of you believe God lives today? He's alive today. He said he is a living God. Daniel called him a living God and steadfast forever, forever. God is a living God. I'm, I'm going to hurry through some of this because some of them, some of these things that are on your chart, I want you to see because it will bring great, great knowledge to you in the future of what we're going to study. God is not only living, but he is omnipresent. I want you to remember this word omnipresent. Say it with me, omnipresent. It's in your notes. It's on the paper that you have. Omnipresent means this. He fills all space and all time. He's God everywhere at all times. This is why we can worship God in Monroe, Louisiana, and they can pray in Ukraine tonight, and he hears them, and he's with them too. He fills all space. He's not one place only, but God in his infinite, eternal way is filling all space and all time. Jeremiah 23, 24 said, Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I feel heaven and earth, saith the Lord. In other words, I'm everywhere. You want to know where God is? He's everywhere. He's in your house. He's in your car. He's in this building. And the reason that, that we can say that, and we'll talk about that in just a few minutes, is because God is not a person. God is a spirit, and I'll prove that to you in just a few minutes. So he's not only omnipresent, but the next thing you see in the chart, put the, leave that chart up just for a moment, if you will, the chart said he's not only omnipresent, but he is omnipotent. Omnipotent. Do you know what omnipotent means? That means he has all power. Amen? Did we lose the chart, Chelsea? You lost it, Tommy? Am I going to send Chelsea up there to get you out of trouble? Amen. I know it's behind me, but it needs to be up here. Huh? Yeah, I can't turn around like this. I need the chart over here. They'll find it in just a minute. Omnipotent means that God has all power. The Lord God omnipotent reigneth, Revelation chapter 19 and verse 6. In thine hand is power and might, and in thy hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all, First uh, Chronicles 29, 12. I can't read all the scriptures. You have them in your hand, but my, my, I want you to understand he's everywhere and he has all power. He is called the Almighty God. If he has all power, the other gods cannot stand up to him that are in this world because he's the God that is omnipotent, and that means he has all power. Amen? The Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Not only is he omnipotent, here's one for you. That next word said he is omniscient. God is omniscient. you got to know who God is before you can understand what God does. So we're taking just a moment tonight in this first chart to talk about who God is. He's everywhere. He has all power. And he is omniscient. God is the all-knowing God. He knows everything. Nothing is hid from God. You can hide it from your mother, your sister, your brother, your father, your cousin. You can't hide anything from God. You can't go anywhere God's not, and you can't do anything God don't know about. Amen? I believe that tonight. The Bible said, for his eyes are upon the ways of man, and he seeth all things, Job 4, or excuse me, 34, 21. Another one in Psalms 139 and 4 said, for there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. The Lord knows everything about you, everything about this world. 
He knows every secret thing of every man. As a matter of fact, in the New Testament, the Bible tells us that the Lord even knows the number of hair in your head. He ain't got a hard time counting mine, let me tell you, but some of you he might. Amen? So he's omnipresent, he's omnipotent, he's alive, he's omniscient, he's eternal, and here's what else he is. He is a spirit. Now, let me dwell right here for a minute. John chapter 4, verse 24 said this, For God is a spirit. Specifically said, God is a spirit. I want you to say this with me because this will give you understanding through all the scriptures. God is not a person. You can't prove, you can't see, you can't. Now we'll talk about how God appeared, but God is not a person. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. As a matter of fact, like wind, God's spirit is invisible. And non-material, yet powerful. You can't see the wind, but you can see the effects of the wind. Amen? Wind can blow over trees, but you never see the wind. Wind can cause the waters to, to rage, but you can't see the wind. God is a spirit. He's like the wind. Our Bible emphatically states that God cannot be seen with human eyes, just as human spirits cannot be seen or touched. How many of you, you know this to be, this is a Dennis Evans quote, how many of you know this to be the truth? I thought about him when I said that because I heard him say that many times. How many of you know this to be the truth? But, but here's the facts. You can, you can see a spirit in somebody. You can't see the spirit, but you can see the actions of the person. Amen? You, you can't see spirits. Spirits are invisible. Here's how I know God is a spirit. 1 John 4 and 12. I'm going to put it on the screen tonight, if you will, Brother Tommy. 1 John 4 and 12. Don't, don't, if, if that's too much and you lose me, don't, don't do it. But 1 John 4 and 12 says this. It says this. No man hath seen God at any time. No man. That's in the New Testament. No man has seen God at any time. You can't see God with a, with a, with a natural eye. In, in John chapter 1 and 18, St. John chapter 1 and 18, the Bible says the same thing. No man has seen God at any time. So we know that God is a spirit, and we know that God is one. Stay with me here. How do I know that? Because one of the greatest things and first teachings that Moses ever gave to the children of Israel was found in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. And he said this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. You know what he said? Teach that to your kids. I'm not going off in that at night because I can chase a rabbit and be gone way off these charts. But he said this, teach that to your children. Teach them at the breakfast table. Teach them at noon. Teach them when they go to bed at night. Teach that. There's only one. Everybody said amen. Deuteronomy 4.35, the Lord, he is God. There is none else, none else beside him. I'm going to give you a couple more. Malachi chapter 2 and verse 10. Have we not all one father? Hath not one God created us? Now look at me, everybody in this building. I want you to say this with me. There's not two. There's not three. There's one. The reason I'm saying that is because that clears up a lot of stuff and a lot of false doctrine in this world. There's only one God. So the central thought of the Bible specifies that God is one and that, that all these interpretations of men, they, they can come and go, but the fact remains there's only one. There's only one God, and he is our Father. Everybody say it with me. He's our Father. The Bible said we have one Father. As a matter of fact, Matthew 7 and 11 says, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, 
give good things to them that ask him. So these are the things that, that God is. You can put the chart back up, Brother Tom, if you will. These are the things that God is. He, he's a creator. He's an eternal God. He's alive. He's living. He's everywhere. He's most powerful, all powerful. He's, he's, he knows everything. He's a spirit. There's only one, and he's our heavenly father. Somebody ought to shout amen. Now, so the next chart, chart two. We're going to talk about God creating angels. All this comes before the beginning of, of creation in Genesis chapter 1. God's angels were created for this purpose, to worship and to serve. The angels were. Here's what Job said. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the, of the earth? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. The, the scriptures teach us, there's, there's several scriptures that we could go to tonight, and, and they're on your, your study sheet. But before the creation of man, there were angels. The first and the highest order of created beings is an angelic host. They were made, they were created by God. Psalms 148 tells us that praise him all ye angels, praise him all ye host. Uh, if you go to Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 6, they don't have to put all these up. They're in your notes. Thou, even thou, O Lord, alone, thou hast made heaven, the heavens of heavens, with all their host, and the host of the heaven worshipeth thee. So angels were made, they were created to worship and to serve God. Amen. The Bible said in Revelation 5 and 11, I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. That's what angels do. Not only that, but, but the Bible said in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 14 that these are ministering spirits that are sent forth to minister for them that are heirs to salvation. Say, that's us. God sends angels to minister for us. I preached one time years ago. We have power to send angels because the Bible said that the angels are ministering spirits that are sent to minister for us. I need the chart back up, if you will. Because here's, here's the thing, not only do they worship and not only do they serve, but they are, they are proclaiming to protect and to proclaim God's message on the earth. Who appeared unto shepherds in, in, the, in the book of Matthew? Who appeared unto shepherds and, and told them what was about to happen in Bethlehem? Told them where to go and who to worship. Amen? The heavenly host appeared unto the shepherds. So they, they came to aid, to protect, and to proclaim God's message in, on the earth. I, I don't want to spend too much time here, but you go through the scripture and you'll find Michael, you'll find Gabriel, you'll find the, the, the movement of angels in the scriptures. There were angels that protected the people of God. There were angels that proclaimed the message of God. They aided the people of God many times. God would send an angel, and an angel would take care of God's business here in this earth. One of the most common angels that we know is Lucifer, son of the morning. Let me tell you about Lucifer a little bit, okay? I, 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 want, you to, I want you to understand some things. We presume that all angels were created holy and perfect in their ways, but the Bible does not describe Satan's origin, but we are certain that he was created by God to worship and to praise him. But, listen, apparently there were various ranks or orders existing in the heavenly host as evidenced by three celestial princes, Gabriel, the mighty one, Michael, who is like God, and Lucifer, son of the morning. Now, if you study this, you will find that Lucifer was in charge of worship. He's in charge of the music. 
He was in charge of worshiping God. Here's what happened in heaven. From a passage in Ezekiel 28, the Bible tells us, don't go there, but you can read it for yourself. We, we, we find information about Lucifer, the most exalted of all angels, occupied a place of prominence, second only to God himself. But there came a time that pride got in heaven. And Lucifer, Lucifer tried to take the place of God. Amen. There was a war in heaven. And the war, Ezekiel depicted Lucifer's decline as a holy angel when he said this, Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. Lucifer was the first sinner. Lucifer sinned before Adam and Eve sinned. Lucifer was an angel. But rebellion and pride and self-exaltation got a hold of Lucifer and overwhelmed him. And his, he, he lost his place because he tried to take the place of God. The war in heaven was Lucifer had one-third of the angels with him. You read that in the book of Revelation. About a third of the angels fell from heaven with Lucifer. But the Bible said that I saw him saw, fall like lightning. God literally kicked him out of heaven. He became what we know as Satan. And Luke 4 and 6 and Ephesians 6 and 12 and 2 Corinthians 4 and 4, all on your sheet of paper. Go read it this week. He, it will tell you that, that he became the prince and the power of the air, and he became the god of this world. That's why this world is in trouble, because he became the god of this world as far as, as manipulating and moving. An angel, an angel is, is not always seen. But there's angels and there's spirits moving in our earth invisible powers present in this earth. I read a book one time. You ought to go get it if you've never read it. It's, I never will forget it. It's called This Present Darkness. If you've never read that book, you ought to go buy that book. And, and it, was, it was given to me by suggestion from Sister Thetis Tinney. But it talks about powers of hell and powers of Satan that hang over certain cities and certain places. And, and you have to break the stranglehold of the powers of darkness to have revival and a move of God. And the things of God, you have to get past the present darkness. Let me tell you, the devil is working overtime in our society and on our world. That's why there's a revival of witchcraft. There's a revival of homosexuality. There's a revival of all kind of sin because the devil is injecting into this world. He's the prince of the power of the air. He's the God of this world. That's what the Bible called him, the God of this world. So Satan, the God of this world, he, he eventually assumed that role. Paul called him the ruler of the darkness of this world, the ruler of darkness. He's powerful, but listen to me right now. He is not omnipresent, and he is not omniscient. Are you listening? And he is not omniscient. I want you to look at me right now. He only knows what you tell him. He only knows what you let him know. And when you say, I don't think I'm going to make it, the devil said, hot dog, we got another one we're pulling down. Come on now. He don't know anything more than you let him know. He cannot be at all places and all times. He has angels. He has spirits. But he he is not omnipresent, he is not omnipotent, and he is not omniscient. You can't find that anywhere. He is an angel, and the angels were instructed where to go by God. And he, as the God of this world, does instruct his angels to go to certain places and do certain things. Amen? Let me just read it to you in closing that part of it in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The God of this world, Satan. So now let's move to the next chart. Here we go. We know that God, who God is, what God is. We know that, first of all, he created angels. There were angels before there was a world. And then in, verse, in, in the first 
chapter of the Bible. The Bible said in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was not form and void. And then it goes into the creation. The first day, the Bible said light appeared. Light and darkness were divided. Okay? That's the first day. The first day. Now, God created the heavens and the earth, and then he starts, he starts in, in speaking the word, he starts saying the things that need to be said for creation. And when he said, let the, the Bible said, he said, let there be light, and there was light. Just that simple. That's how powerful God was. Let there be light, and there was light. So, I'm going to move quickly through these charts tonight because I want to get to some some other things because I want but I want you to see what happened in the in the creation by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth Psalms 33 it's in your notes for he spake and it was done he commanded and it stood stood fast so to create the wonderful world God used 6 days it's, upon, it's on this chart. And you see by what, what is on this chart, six days. Let me talk about days for a minute. Because we, we've heard people say, well, the Lord counts a thousand years as a day. But if you notice in the creation, he says the morning and the evening were the first day. The morning and the evening were the second day. I believe it was literally a 24-hour period that God created in six days. I do not believe it was 6,000 years of creation. Can you see a plant that would get 500 years of darkness and 500 years of light? Tell me whether it's, if it's going to grow or not. Hallelujah. Just something to think about. The Bible does say one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, but not in creation. The one day that the Lord created, he talked about the evening and the morning being the first day, the second day. For in six days, the Bible said in Exodus 20, in six days the Lord made all, made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that are in them is, and rested on the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. So on the first day, he said, let there be light, and there was light. On the second day, he said, let there be space between the waters. The waters. There's two distinct acts, or, or two distinct acts are recorded. The firmament was made and the waters were divided from each other. Firmament means limitless expanse, or the atmospheric heaven surrounding the earth, the air, the sky, the heavens. So what the Lord did. Is he, there's water in the air. I don't know if you know this or not. There's much more water in the atmosphere than there is in the ocean. We got quiet on that one, didn't it? Because the atmosphere is so much bigger than the ocean. You can see the water in the ocean. You don't see the water. But let me tell you, there's, there's an atmosphere for here and millions of miles perhaps that that there's water that is in the atmosphere. The firmament is an ocean in suspension with waves and billows tossed by wind. That's why it's not hard to get a thunderstorm or a rain. There's water in the atmosphere. There's water that forms in the atmosphere. You can't live. The upper waters of the firmament furnish moisture for providing food and sustaining life and of the beast and the bird and mankind. In fact, the firmament is so extensive, it could hold in suspension several times the amount of water in all the oceans upon the face of the earth. That's what God did. He just simply spoke, and the waters were divided, the waters above, the waters below. On the third day, the Bible said there were oceans and dry land and plant life created. You can read all this. It's in your notes, but you can read it. Because it's in, in Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2. You can read all of this. In the fourth day, God created the sun, moon, and stars. This is where God literally put time in place. Because he put the sun in strategic place. He put the moon in strategic place. He put the stars in strategic place. Amen? I like not got that one out. But here's, here's the facts. 
It was here that the solar system was put in on the fourth day. How many of you understand what a marvelous work of God in his creation that the solar system is? Because if our earth was too close to the sun, nothing could live. It was too far from the sun, we'd all freeze to death. The earth that we live upon was strategically placed, as are all the other planets. We've learned a whole lot since the creation. Science agrees with what's taught here. Amen? Biology agrees with what's taught here. Everything agrees with the word of the Lord. So uh, the fourth day, uh, the, the Bible talks about the sun, moon, and stars become invisible and begin to function for our planet as light holders. They were already in existence as part of heaven. But on, the, on this day, God implemented the solar system and created time. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. You know what he said every day when he got through, when he, when he divided the waters, when he made the oceans, the dry land, the plant life? This is so unique. In the fourth day, you know what God said every time he done something? Huh? He said, it is good. The Lord would look at it and say, it is good. That's what he did. On the fifth day, at the dawn of this day, vegetation was only the only existing life. But by nightfall, the earth was filled with fish and insects and birds. The fifth day, he made the creatures, the birds, the insects. God created every bit of that. On the sixth day, he came back and he said, you know what? We need some cattle and we need reptiles and we need beasts. The Bible said he made the whales in the sea. He made all living things. He made everything in six days. All that you see, I said it to begin this lesson, in six days of creation, God would just speak, and there it was. Speak, and there it was. He spoke the world into existence. Man, I could preach right here. Do you know what would happen to our lives if God could just speak into our lives? Do you know what God could do for us if God would just speak to us here tonight? Hallelujah. So on the sixth day, he made all of that, and then... He said, I got one more creation. And I'm paraphrasing here. But he, he, he reached down. Now, well, notice, he spoke in day one. He spoke in day two. He spoke in day three. He spoke in day four. He spoke in day five. He spoke in day six. But at the end of that day, he reached down and scooped up some dust. And he, he formed a man. He put a heart in him. He put a gallbladder in him. He put an appendix in him. He put tendons and muscles. I want you to think about this. Look, look, look at our bodies and, and tell me that, that God doesn't know what he's doing. And he made a man. And he looked at that man. The, the Bible said, he said, let us make man in our image. And so he made man, watch me now, not like he was because God is a spirit. But the Bible said in Hebrews, he spoke of things that were not as though they were. And he made a man in the likeness of his own image of how he would come in the New Testament as the man, Christ Jesus. He made a man. The first Adam, as a matter of fact, the Bible says that God created Adam. That Adam was the first Adam. Jesus Christ was called the second Adam because God made Adam exactly like he was going to be in the New Testament. He made him. So, so God breathed into his nostrils. Scripture says this, and he became a living soul. Amen? Here's what God said. Let me read this. Genesis 1, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. 
Male and female created he them. Amen? So that clay was formed, and in that clay, he put spirit, body, and soul. He put something in that creation that no other creation had. Everything else operates with instinct, but not man. He put in man will, a choice, the power to have your own will. He created mankind to make him happy and to worship him and to be in fellowship with God. He did that. Man, man was created. Here's how I know that. Revelation 4.11 says this. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things for thy pleasure. They were, they are, and were created for thy pleasure. God made man for his own pleasure. He intended, man was given to, uh, man was made by God to give glory and honor to God. Amen. So then he said it is good, and guess what? Day seven, he rested. Everybody needs rest. God proved that. God himself rested. I still believe in the Sabbath day. I still believe remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. That's one of the commandments, isn't it? And God rested on the seventh day. He took He took his time to to look at all that he had made and he rested now now there's there's been a lot of theories over time does anybody remember the charles darwin theory that was real popular when i was growing up charles darwin theory you know what that is the theory of evolution that taught us that man came from monkey started teaching that in our schools man i don't believe man came from monkey can I give you a little a, a little tidbit of history before I go on tonight? Oh, I got to hurry. Yet in the later years, watch this, talking about Charles Darwin. In the later years, Charles Darwin saw the era of his ways. Students of evolution should be informed that in his final days, Darwin returned to his faith in the Bible. He was bedfast, and he made this confession to his companions. He said, I was a young man with an unformed ideas. I threw out queries, suggestions, wondering all the time about everything. And to my astonishment, the idea took like wildlife and people made a religion out of my theories. And he said, I'm going back to the Bible and faith in God. So we got theories out there that has no backing. So here's what happened. God made Adam and Eve, or God made Adam. He looked down. Let's go to the next chart. God looks down on Adam. He's in the garden. God, Adam had dom- dominion over the cattle, over the, over the beast of the field, the fowl of the air. He named, Adam named everything. When you say cow, Adam named it. When you say snake, Adam named it. Amen. He named the fowl of the air. He named the beast of the field. He had dominion. Eden was a paradise. It was a paradise. He gave Adam the paradise of God. And this is the only thing he said you can't do, Adam. You'll notice in the very top. He said, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So he created. He looks down and Adam's, he's naming all these animals and he's petting the lions. And lions weren't mean. And he's petting the tigers. And he's playing with the hippopotamus who will eat you alive right now. And, and, and all this stuff. But God looked down and, and, and he said, Adam, needs, he needs somebody. So he did the most marvelous thing he's ever done in creation to me. Adam went to sleep and he reached down, took a rib out of his side, and he made him a woe man. Aren't you glad God did that? Would we be in a mess without that? God made a woman 
and said, this is going to be your help meet. This is going to be your help meet. So Adam and Eve, notice in this on that chart, see that up on the left-hand top? It said first dispensation, innocence. Now, i got to say this to go any further. Bible scholars divide the span from creation to the end of time in what we call dispensations, okay? There are literally seven dispensations of time. We are living in the six. But a dispensation is a period of time how God deals with man. And after man's tragic failure in the garden, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, the, 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 the progression reveals, the progressive dispensation reveals and expands how God dealt with men and, and what happened in that period of time. There's a dispensation called law, and, and there's, there's things that we're going to learn about each dispensation. But right now, it's innocent because Adam and Eve were naked in a garden, in a paradise, and didn't even know they were naked. True. Until one day, the serpent, Satan, came in the form of a serpent and looked at Eve and said, Have God said? He starts questioning her. He said, hath God said. Can I tell you tonight that always when the devil starts tempting you, he will start questioning what you believe and questioning whether it's truth or not. Questioning if God really said that or not. So Adam and Eve are in innocence. The serpent came and Eve was convinced because the, the, the serpent said to Eve, the reason he don't want you to eat of that tree is because he's afraid you'll be God like him. He's afraid you're going to become a God. He don't want you eating of that because he, he's afraid of you. And, and the serpent beguiled Eve, convinced her that she ought to eat of that tree. Somebody said it was an apple. I don't know what it was. It looks pretty good. But the fruit of that tree had the knowledge of good and evil. And the moment she took a bite of that, of that fruit, there was disobedience toward God. And she not only took the fruit, but she convinced Adam. Now, we can't blame it all on the woman, but she did take it first. And she did convince her husband. But women have a way of doing that. Oh, you better hush. You ain't sitting by your wife, surely. So, so we understand that. The serpent beguiled Eve. And when that happened, the serpent tempted. She got Adam to sin. You see up on the right, he ate of the forbidden fruit. You know this story perhaps, but I'm going to make sure you understand it. Sin broke the communion with God, disobedience to what God said, Broke the communion with God because remember, God said in the top, the day you eat of that tree, you're going to die. Did they fall over dead? No, they did not. No, they did not. But there was consequences and there was death. And I'm going to show you how. Because sin broke the communion with God. As a matter of fact, it was then that God comes walking through the garden, the Bible said, in the cool of the day, and he calls Adam's name. And he said, Adam, where art thou? Guess where Adam was? Because the minute they took a bite of the fruit, they looked down and said, oh, we're naked. And they ran and got palm leaves and put them together and covered themselves with the leaves. And God said, God knew where they were. There's enough sermons in this I could, preach, I could preach three weeks. God knew exactly where they were. But he said, Adam, where art thou? And Adam said, I was afraid because I was naked. He confessed immediately, not that he had eaten, but that he knew 
that he was naked. He didn't know that before he ate that tree or of that tree, but now he understood that his naked was, was a shame because he, he was innocent in that first dispensation. He was innocent, but suddenly he went from innocence to conscience. And the next dispensation we're going to study about is the dispensation of conscience. But sin broke the communion with God. So here is where man becomes a sinner. What really happened was Eve and Adam disobeyed, and no, he didn't die. Let me tell you, Adam lived 930 years. He didn't die immediately. He didn't. But here's what happened. There's three kind of deaths. Watch me here now. There's physical death. That's when man dies and he's separated from spirit. His body dies. There's spiritual death. Spiritual death is when, is, is, is when man's separated from God. The second death is spoken of in the book of Revelation. It is when men die the second death and they die forever, eternally, without God. There's three kinds of death. Not only did man's spirit die, but his soul that's his mind, will, and emotions became darkened and subject to the enemy. In other words, all of a sudden, he went from not knowing anything about sin or disobedience or nakedness, and here he is now, and he's, he's a man that was made to live forever, to dwell in the garden, to be innocent, is now understanding that he's committed sin. This is why... Let me say it this to you this way. God's nature is life. Satan's nature is death. All through the scripture you can read that. In the New Testament you can read that. That's why, that's why Ephesians 2, 1 and 2 said, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And then he said in 2 Corinthians 4 and 4, in whom the gods of this world have blinded the minds of them which believe not less the light of the glorious gospel, who shine the image of God, who shine unto them. So he's saying that death comes from Satan. Life comes from God. Notice in the bottom part of your chart, body, soul, spirit. Soul is the mind and emotion ruled by sensual passions and desires. Body is subject to pain, disease, death, and decay, and stuff on your tongue. That's not on the chart. <laughs> you that are watching by internet, you have to be here to understand. Spirit is separated from God in union with Satan. In other words, this is what your body's made out of. This is what your makeup is. And now there's spiritual death. There's death. How do I know? How do I know? Here's, here's what really happened. When Adam and Eve sinned, they were driven from the garden. Amen? The curse of sin. God began to judge them immediately. The curse of sin. Go to the next uh, chart, if you will, Brother Tommy. I will show you what happens. Innocent ended in judgment. How? God knew they sinned. God called them. And guess what God did? He took the animal and killed it and took the skin of that animal and wrapped up Adam and Eve so their nakedness would not be shown. Y'all don't get quiet on me. But here's what I do want to tell you. That from now, from then until now, God don't like you showing your nakedness. I can preach right here. What you wear matters. God hid their nakedness. God don't intend... He intends, watch me close, he intends for men to dress like men and women to dress like women and all of us to be godly. Just telling you, go study it out. It's that way all through the scripture. So the curse of sin came, an immediate spiritual death for Adam and Eve, a future physical death. Up until then, 
Nobody was going to die. Adam and Eve were not going to die. You know why they you know why they died? Because they said. You know why you and I have funerals today? Because they said. Their sin brought death to every man. There was no death. It brought spiritual sin. It brought future physical death. And it brought separation from God's presence, which means they no longer could rule in the earth. So they were driven out of the garden. And then God began to pronounce the curse. Here's what he said. First of all, he turned to the serpent, the snake. Uh, there's, there's all kind of theories about what that serpent looked like in that form. But here's, here's what I do know. Some have said that, that it wasn't a snake at that point. But here's what the Lord said. He looked at the serpent and said, Thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. He cursed the serpent. And then he turned to Eve, and he said, You're next, and here's what I'm going to tell you. Before that, you wouldn't have had a problem having a baby. But guess what? Eve messed all that up. And the reason women have trouble in childbirth, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. And in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. This is what God told Eve. And then he looked at Adam, and he said, Cursed is the ground. The reason there's thorns and thistles and men have to work and plow and toil is because they sin. Adam sinned. And he said this, Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat thereof all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return to the ground. Adam got cursed. Eve got cursed. The serpent got cursed. And Adam and Eve were driven from the paradise of God. And their expulsion was permanent because God placed two cherubims at the gate of the garden with flaming swords and said, you can't come back in here. Now, did they die? Yeah, they died. They died spiritually. They, they brought future death upon all mankind. The Bible said in the New Testament, since Adam sinned, we've all sinned. It also said, since one man brought sin... And sin brought death. That's why we all die. Sin is the repercussion, or excuse me, death is the repercussion of sin. No, Adam wouldn't have died. Eve wouldn't have died. They were living in an innocent state in the paradise of God where God had placed them with everything perfect. But now they've disobeyed and they brought these, expo these, these, uh, these sinful things upon the earth and brought judgment to themselves. Amen? Hallelujah. Let me move very quickly. Chart number six, the wonderful promise. It's our last chart. I'm right on time. He said, I'm going to put enmity between thee and the woman, told the serpent that, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. You know what that is? That's a prophecy. In Genesis chapter three, the very first three chapters of the Bible, the Lord said, there's going, to be, there's going to be somebody come from a woman, the seed of a woman, and I'm going to tell you, Mr. Mr. Devil, Mr. Serpent, that he's going to bruise your head. That's a prophecy of Jesus Christ in the first three chapters of Genesis. Amen? God was warning the serpent that a descendant of a deceived woman would someday destroy or bruise his head. We find that. Behold, a virgin shall conceive, bear a son. Thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So it's coming to pass. Spiritual warfare. Here's what happened. Jesus Christ was born. That's the seed of the woman. And then he told the serpent, you're going to bruise his heel. In other words, there's going to be spiritual warfare. We understand spiritual warfare in this church. We understand that every day the devil's working overtime to destroy the people of God, to destroy the things of God in our life. 
and the devil has come to bruise the heel of Jesus Christ. But let me just tell you, that last chart says it all. In the end, let me tell you who wins. It started in the beginning. The battle rages all through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. The battle is still raging in 2022 in Monroe, Louisiana. It's a battle for right and wrong. It's about the devil has never wanted God to win since the Lord kicked him out of heaven. It's a battle where we are just pawns on the chessboard. We may not be much or anything, but if we're called by his name and we're born of his spirit and we're baptized in his name, I want to tell you we become the recipients of the part of God that 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 is a part of the victory of God. And the de- let me, I, t- I told somebody just the other day, the devil don't bother people or he's not worried about people. Let me put it this way, that are not serving him, that are, serving, that are not serving God. He's, he's not worried about the guy that's down doing drugs tonight. He's not worried about the guy that, that's down in the tavern or the bar room tonight. He's not, he's, he, let me tell you, when we come to church, the devil come to church. Bible said, when the sons of God came before men, but Satan came with them. That's in the book of Job. Go read it for yourself. So I'm just telling you, the devil is, is, is he's doing whatever he can to disorient us, distract us. But the, the victor, the victor is, is Jesus Christ. None of these things are going to win over the Lord Jesus Christ. He's still omnipotent. He's still powerful. He's still everywhere. He still knows everything. He knows what you're going through. He knows what kind of battle you're fighting. He knows your mental state. He knows what you said today. He knows where you're going tomorrow because he knows everything. And he has a power that no devil in hell can defeat you when you put your hand in the hand of the master. Hallelujah. I'm just telling you today, these are the beginning of things. You know what the Bible, you know what Genesis means? Beginning. Beginning of what? Beginning of the victory. Beginning of the downfall. Beginning of family. Beginning of all these things that we know about today. It all started in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. And that's, that's, that's all we've really covered tonight. The remainder of the Bible is the intriguing story of what God did to redeem man from the slavery of Satan, from the downfall of mankind. Adam, I wish you hadn't have done that. But let me tell you, let me tell you, God was ready. And God performed the things Old and New Testament to bring his people back to him. And for fallen man, let me tell you what it's going to be like. When we get to heaven, fallen man is going to again be in the paradise of God. And there's going to be a river. There's there's another tree in the Bible that that they weren't allowed to eat of. And one of the reasons that I feel like that the cherubims were placed in the gate was because if they could have got in, there was a tree called the tree of life. There's a tree called the tree of life. And if they would have eaten the tree of life, they would have lived forever. But let me tell you, with the tree of life, you don't find it from Genesis all the way to Revelation. But there again, you find it. In heaven, there's going to be a river, and it runs from the tree of life. Mm. Good stuff.